I was born just before the depression started and when the depression hit it, it was tough. Uh, we had a my mom and dad had a ladies store downtown. It was a mile walk. Although dad ran the store, it's funny that people always tell me to this day about my mother. You know, everybody was poor in Niles at that time. So you would, the way to buy something was to do a layaway. They would buy something in September and pay so much a week until Christmas or so much a week until Easter. And then they would take their garments home and they all love my mother, and, and they, they all love my dad. My dad was more, I think, of a man's man, and he played baseball on the, or softball on the, on the Kiwanis team, and he, he was very active among the men. My mother was very active among all, all the people. From my mother, <laughs> although there were so many things I admired. I, I don't think I carried through with some of the traits. Uh, for example, in uh, mom and dad in the store used to save every rubber band, every paper clip. Nothing was ever thrown away. Uh, my mother, from the time she was married until the time she died, would drive, you know, three miles if she saw beans on sale for 30 cents. I mean, she just saved every nickel on one hand. On the other hand, and I, and I didn't quite inherit that, on the other hand, she was extremely generous. Very little for herself, but for everybody else. I mean, whether it was baking a cake for them or a pie, or later in life after dad died, of taking care of so many people. When my mother died, I must have had 15 letters of people to whom she gave money and on a regular basis, never told us, never, never did a thing like that, but she was just extremely generous with everybody, extremely generous and loving. Well, Marjorie was, was always a little lady and uh, rather quiet uh, studied hard, helped mother at home. Uh, she and I occasionally uh, were a little mischievous. Uh, uh, one day our parents did something that mispleased us, so we, uh, uh, it was in Marjorie's bedroom, we took all of our clothes, or at least half of the clothes, and threw them out the window. Uh, that was unlike Marjorie. I must have instigated that. But Marjorie was always very stable. She was very beautiful, very, very beautiful. And just quiet, studious, uh, made a wonderful sister and, and uh, kept me in tow pretty much. Uh, she was great. Jerry was a porcelain doll. Jerry was gorgeous. She was gorgeous. Uh, like any other kid, little kid, she ran around and, you know, never, never walked slowly, just ran everywhere, very much like Astra does today. And uh, I was Jerry's big hero. So in, in junior high and in, in high school, we all carried to, to basketball games uh, duffel bags. You know, you slung them over your shoulder. And she used to, the biggest thrill of her life was to be able to carry my duffel bag, which was as big as she was. <laughs> but she, she, she uh, carried that all the time. I, you know, Jerry and Stanley moved 32 years ago um, to California. And we saw her, as you know, many times, a couple times a year for many years. And, and uh, uh, since she was living out there, we were living here. And, and when the family's together, you don't see many of, of their other friends. You're busy being a family. And we, we had Thanksgiving at Jerry's, as you know, for 20, 25 years, uh, even when, when they lived in California. And uh, 
when <clears throat> Jerry got sick, and this just goes back several weeks, and I went to California and spent three days with her, um, there must have been 20 or 30 people a day who came in, and if the caretaker said she's sleeping, they'd say, <clears throat> well, we'll just stay for a few minutes. And it was just, just constant, just constant. And there were some people who came every day, and they came three times a day. I, her, her friends, her good friends were just, you couldn't count them. And perhaps the greatest tribute of all was that we found out uh, about the time of the funeral that about the same time there was a memorial service in Canton, Ohio, where she just lived for a few years and left there 32 years ago. And there were over 65 people at the memorial service 32 years after they left town. So Jerry was, was you know, a, a, a docent. She, she uh, was president of the temple at one time. She was president of federation at one time. She was president of, Pl of Planned Parenthood. Uh, she, she did so many things, so many things, and always with a sense of humor. And, and uh, I just never realized, I knew that I loved her, and I knew what she meant to us. I had no concept of what she meant to other people, no concept at all. She was a wonderful, wonderful woman. With my mother, you know, families, it was extremely important. Um, her own family, uh, she had come from New York. One of her sisters moved to Ohio and practically into our home. Her husband was a doctor, Lou Rosinski, who died young. My uncle Ben and uncle Harry were brought into my dad's business. After he had been in business for uh, a few years, he open stores for them, one in Painesville, one in New Philadelphia. My Uncle Manny, my mother's brother in Alliance, Ohio, they opened one in Kent. So he had a number of stores, but he, his brothers and his brother-in-law and so forth were, became partners. I mean, he, they weren't working for him. They all worked together. They met every Sunday at our house. And my mother cooked for everybody in those days. You had a big chicken roast or a beef roast, mashed potatoes, uh, apple pie with ice cream. I mean, it wasn't the world's best diet, but we ate a, a very hearty diet. And Mother did all that cooking. It was, it was extremely... Across the street, there's just a great big field where the church is now in the church parking lot. And we used to play baseball there, football, um, every day. Um, in those days, we went out as kids in the morning, on a week, you know, a, a Saturday or Sunday morning, and, and uh, came home when it was dark. Uh, you didn't have play dates, and, and there was no, uh, no crime around, and, and kids were just safe all the time. And, and kids just took off for the day and we didn't go anywhere. We just stayed in our neighborhood and played. Well, we played baseball from morning till night, and basketball, football. It wasn't organized. We didn't have Little League in those days. But we sure had fun from morning till night. Uh, when I first started playing ball, I was one of the littlest kids in the neighborhood. And Don Pepino lived around the corner, and he was a little kid too. <laughs> so they would always choose up sides. First of all, you chose up sides by putting your hand on a bat, and that's the way the two captains chose. And then the winner chose the first kid, and the loser the second, and then the winner chose the third, the fourth, and so forth. And when they got all through choosing, Don Pepino and I would still be left. So each side would take one of us, but our outs didn't count. <laughs> so they always let us play, but on the other hand, it wasn't to the detriment of either team. It was a wonderful childhood. 
As I got to school age, I walked to the corner, turned left, and then walked to, to junior high school. It was about a mile. And I walked there and back every day, as did all the kids. Um, no school buses. I guess that's why kids are thinner today, or thinner then than they are, are today. We sure did a lot of walking. Wonderful, wonderful teachers at that school. I can remember almost every one of them. Really devoted, fantastic teachers. And then after I finished Washington Junior High School, then I just walked straight down Robbins Avenue to the high school. I would walk down in the morning, home, at, home for lunch, back after lunch, back in the evening, or the evenings were usually sports practices, but then I would walk home from there. And that's about a mile and a half each way. So I was walking six miles a day, never thought a thing about it. No, no kids had cars, no school buses, anything like that. And you can imagine the number of kids that lived in this neighborhood, all young kids. And just, just, we all spent an enormous amount of time together and worked together, played together. Uh, it's interesting that there were only three Jewish families in Niles and never, never any overt signs of anti-Semitism, probably just none. I was class president for four years. Uh, I was president of student council, so you know, obviously being in a minority didn't, didn't make any difference. Uh, so I grew up with a, with a childhood uh, you know, free of any prejudice that I ever knew about. And when you combine that with loving parents like I had, um, it was a wonderful childhood. Um, you know, on one hand, my, my dad especially was a disciplinarian, and there were certain things that had to be done. You know, I said I took care of the yard and the windows and the gardens. And well, I had to. And uh, on the other hand, there was just a tremendous amount of, of love and support and, oh, my wonderful son this, my darling Bill that, and, uh, and so forth. And yet, uh, you know, a B on a report card uh, did not meet with approval, and a C, well, I guess I didn't get any Cs. I once got a, a report card where I had all A's and a D in conduct, and, and I was, at that time, I thought I was 12 or 13, and my dad took a strap to me and beat my, beat on my rear end. Um, so uh, on one hand, there was a great deal of love, but on the other hand, there was a tremendous amount of expectation. Uh, expectations were very high and um, you, you had to perform, you had to perform. So you had this love on one hand and this push on the other. Uh, I think much more than we do today with our kids, much, much more pushing. There wasn't the, the psychology of, uh, of how to treat children the way there is now. There was just sort of common sense and love, and I think that's the way uh, we were lucky to grow up, Marjorie and Jerry and I. The neighborhood was wonderful. Uh, there were perhaps if I take a hundred families, there were perhaps 20 uh, Protestant or um, Catholic families. Uh, there were only three Jewish families in the whole town. These were the days we used to sit on a front porch. There's the front porch. The living room was right behind. There was a sun, this was a sun room. Upstairs were my, to the left were where dad and mom slept and that was Margie and Jerry's room. And we had the attic. So when we had company, we always used the attic. And my room was in the back. And I was in charge of taking care of this big lawn. And for some reason, my imagination is that this was a, a big house. Uh, I never thought of it as being a small house when I was a kid. As you can see, the other houses are all about the same size. 
And you know, we lived here, my parents moved here in the, tw in the late 20s. So I lived here in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And the neighborhood, believe it or not, really hasn't changed. This house looks just like it did all those years ago. I had such wonderful memories of uh, my sports uh, uh, during football season. Uh, since I didn't play football, I wrote the sports for the football for the Niles Times. I went to, to training camp and wrote everybody up there. And at halftime, because we didn't have a bass player, the bass drum, I was a bass drum player. So I was busy during the football season too. But above all came my grades. I mean, uh, they, had to be, they had to be good. They had to be right up there. You know, in a way, this was uh, the baseball field at home, across from the house, and, and the track, I guess, were sort of my field of dreams. I have such wonderful memories here. I, I think the, one of the most vivid memories and funniest is uh, my senior year, uh, well, all through track, I ran the half mile, and I got, oh, but you improve as you get, go from a sophomore to a junior, and I was pretty good as a junior, and by my senior year, I was quite good, and I never lost a, a meet. And we came to the district meet then, I was undefeated, and uh, there were about 60 or 70 runners, and uh, it's a quarter mile track, so you run it twice. So. Uh, I was running third. In front of me were two guys from the same school. And uh, every time I tried to pass them on the right, they, the two of them would move right. And if I tried to pass them on the left, the two of them would move left. I couldn't get by them. So as I came by on the first lap, what they call the bell lap, they ring the bell, and Coach Hooker was standing here on the infield. And I, and I looked at him and I went like this, Coach, what can I do? Because he saw the trouble I was having. So he pointed to the stands there, and you could not see, that. you can't see the track because of those stands, so you can't see what happens behind them. So he pointed over there, and he went like this, and then like this, and I knew exactly what he meant. So when we got behind, I waited till just the, to the end of that, where the, the barricade is there, and I took a step there, cut, came right up behind and took a step, and between them and used my elbows like this. So as we emerged, I was first and the two of them were still stumbling from where I cracked them as I came through them. And so I won the race and I was undefeated, but I'll never forget that. I'll never forget Coach Hooker with and that's just what I did. My childhood buddies <laughs> were also all Italian. Uh, Don Fapino was a good friend, uh, uh, Jimmy DePasquale, Carmen Giuello. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were, in those days, there were no such thing as equal rights for, for, rights for women. So we had five class officers. I was president for three years, and the other four were Italians, and all dear, wonderful friends. Between my junior and senior year, I went to work for the Stevens family in New York at the Polo Grounds. And um, they were a family from Niles, four sons. They invented the hot dog. And they owned the concessions in Saratoga, the Yankee Stadium, uh, the Polo Grounds, all the racetracks from uh, New York uh, to Florida huge business with no sons. So I knew them quite well because they were from Niles and uh, they would come home once in a while and invite me over. And so they invited me to come and work for a summer in Yankee Stadium or in the Polo Grounds. And, um, you know, I love sports and wow, that, that changed my mind. And uh, so when I went back, so when I started college, I did not, I took very little of the sciences. 
and I majored in literature and, um, and some business courses with the idea of going to work for the Stevenses. But then when I got back to school that fall, I just the love was wonderful as they were and as I could, you know, had visions of being a multimillionaire. I, I couldn't get over the hurdle and I decided I was going into medicine. Senior year was tough. I had to take, start taking sciences. I got accepted then into medical school with the provision that I would finish my sciences before fall. So that summer, I went from Oberlin College to the University of Wisconsin, finished my organic chemistry and physics, and then started uh, Ohio State in the fall. And um, it was my teachers who decided I should go to Oberlin. A couple of them were Oberlin graduates, and Oberlin, at that time, I think it still is, was one of the uh, best schools in the small schools in the Midwest. Um, I was very happy there. Uh, Don Pepino was there with me. We had some great experiences. Uh, Don, you know, turned out to be a wonderful businessman. He became a multimillionaire in the insurance business. And uh, when I got there, we started several businesses. Uh, I, uh, by myself, started a uh, laundry and dry cleaning business. And uh, I would, had a deal with all the dormitories that if they would collect the laundry and dry cleaning from all the people in their dorm uh, and then take them to the dry cleaner laundry, that I would give them 10% of everything they took down and I would keep 5%. So I was making 5% on most of the laundry and dry cleaning done at Oberlin College, or a good deal of it. On a, I used to collect on Sunday nights. One Sunday night I came home, and Don Pepino and a guy named uh, Yang from Honolulu, and a bunch of the guys were playing uh, poker. So I hadn't really ever played much poker, so I said, can I play, guys? And Don said, Bill, go away. This isn't for you. And I said, no, I'd like to. No, Bill, don't play. So I insisted. I played. And by 3 o'clock in the morning, I had lost all of my uh, money in my pocket and two years of free laundry and dry cleaning to Don Pepino and his roommate. And I swear they changed clothes three times a day. Fortunately, the laundry burned down, <laughs> so I escaped that. And we used to sell, I had a corsage business, I booked dance bands. Uh, I waited table uh, at the Oberlin Inn. I used to work just Sundays, and I would eat so much you couldn't imagine. And I made enough in tips to, to last me the rest of the week. So I was eating fruit, uh, free, I had a corsage business. Oh, we were in the sandwich business. And there used to be a big fight every year between the sophomores and the freshmen. There was a huge ball and they'd each crush it to the other person's goal. And <laughs> Don and I were there selling sandwiches. <laughs> so uh, college too was a, was a great experience. It was hard work. Uh, the <clears throat> competition at college was much tougher than it was in high school because it's a very selective college um, and a little harder to get into. So that we had students from all over the United States and Europe, even though the classes were only about 500 students and I played basketball for Oberlin. Um, I did not run track. Uh, I was busy with my businesses in addition to my studies. Um, I had some wonderful friends there, uh, four especially, Don Pepino, Ed Van Meter, 
um, Ted Danforth and Bob Bear. David had been born in Brooklyn uh, at Kings County or at Kings County Hospital, yeah. And uh, we just lived a block and a half in what they call a uh, down floor, downstairs apartment. It was really a cellar. <laughs> no windows up on top. And uh, um, when we then went into the Air Force, David was um, about uh, one and a half or one. And uh, uh, Stephen was born in Limestone, Maine, in this in the 52 base. And um, on the day of Stephen's birth, they had the sack bombing contest competition, and it was the first round-the-world non-stop plane, non-stop flight, where we refueled six times, and I was on that flight. I was the flight surgeon. So when we got back, there was a huge party at the club, and everybody said, Doc, have a drink, Doc, have a drink. And I did. <laughs> and it must have been about 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and Stephen was born that day while I was on the flight. And it uh, must have been now 2 o'clock in the morning, and one of the uh, colonels said, Doc, you know, I know you don't drink that much, but you're looking a little little bad and maybe you ought to go home and I said yeah I, I think you're right so I walked out to my car and I can remember uh, you know this is really good judgment to go home and I got into my car and I started home and everything went black so I thought well the intelligent thing to do is to stop and someone will come along the next thing I knew I, I awakened on the bathroom floor at home, um, having thrown up all over the place and being half unconscious. The next thing I remember was being in the hospital. And I woke up the day after Stephen came home from the hospital. And I never knew how I got to the hospital. I didn't know anything. When I left, and I didn't know what had happened to me. My car was parked outside the hospital. So when I got out of the hospital, again, didn't know what happened. I never knew until I left the base, probably a year and a half later. When I left, there were two of my friends, two majors there, and they said, uh, Doc, I'm sure you wondered what happened that night when you left the club. I said, yeah. They said, you drove right into the lake, and <laughs> you would have drowned. We came in after you got you out, got the car out, took it, got it washed and cleaned up and put it at the hospital. But they never told anybody because they wanted to protect my reputation. I wasn't known as a drunk. Shortly after Stephen got home, David was waiting for him and he was in a carriage um, inside the front door. And David opened the uh, uh, front door and pushed the carriage down the steps. So David was not welcoming to his younger brother. And my dad said, look, you're 33 years old. It's time you go to work and earn a living. So I came back to Warren because I loved my parents so much. And I could be close to them when I practiced. And as I told you before, my dad set up all the economics and I taught in Cleveland. So I enjoyed that part too. And I started doing stapedectomies. I was born in Warren, Ohio, because my mother lived there. And my dad actually was not there. He was in the army in Germany, World War II, 1944. And he, in fact, didn't see me for two and a half years. Or maybe, maybe I was 18 months, something like that. And in between being born in Ohio, where my mom lived, we, she and I, moved to Philadelphia, which was my dad's home, and we lived there with my dad's mom and dad, my nana and papa. And then we stayed there. When my dad got out of the service, we moved into one of these um, 
facilities or buildings they, they created for the guys and gals coming home from the military. And we lived there. I had a nanny, I remember. And um, my mom was working as a waitress. My dad had a job at an auto works. Well, I loved going to work with my dad. We were very close. And I went to work with him at three, four o'clock in the morning. Got to see the whole action going on at the uh, dairy farm. And I helped deliver milk. While I was in nursing, rotating through surgical nursing, Dr. Lippy was doing surgery and I got to spend some time with him as, as well as other surgeons. So that was the very first time I met him. And uh, I was pretty impressed with him, as was everybody. I met Fred and Belva Levine and Fred and Belva Levine at Shul asked me one day if I'd be interested in being on the committee for the Israel Tennis Centers. And they were having an event and I said, yes, I'd love to. I was a tennis player, avid tennis player. And so were Frank and Brian, um, my two sons. So, that was the beginning of Sandra and Bill because I went to the event as a committee member and Bill was the speaker. It was the home at the home of Kenny Schnitzer in downtown Houston, Texas. I think I'd like to close uh, by talking about and thanking a person who I think is really the glue of our family, and that's Sandra. Uh, I think it's been over 30 years and I found my soulmate. Uh, she's been a wonderful wife. She's a driving force and for me, you know, she takes such good care of me, and this isn't because I'm old, it's because she's always done it. Uh, when we pack to go somewhere, she says, put out your clothes, and she does the packing. She insists on packing and that I have everything. She makes my reservations six months in advance for the whole year when I'm traveling to Florida and back, for example. She makes the family arrangements whenever we travel and we meet together. She just is a working dynamo. It's very seldom that you see a woman who works that hard and accomplishes as much as Sandra but it's still that ladylike, because usually some of those women who are such great achievers are pretty tough. It's not so with Sandra, she's as gentle as can be. And I, I think that, uh, and, and she's the same to everybody in the family. Uh, our two oldest granddaughters, when they graduated from high school, were asked each one a couple of years apart to write an essay on who in your life, outside of your parents, have been the most influential. Both of them wrote they're softer. And they, you know, she, what she does is, and, and I never heard of this before, each child when they're 12, uh, she allows to pick where they'd like to go in the world. And the two of them go off for 10 days to two weeks. The two girls went to Paris and London. Harrison went to the Galapagos Islands. And Adam, who's the next grandchild, would like to go on a safari to Africa. So just the two of them go. And the bonding that goes on in those trips is just remarkable. So Sandra, I love you so much. And I want to thank you for adding so much to not only to my life, but to the life of this whole family and being a cohesive force that holds us all together. May you do it for many years, and may I be around to witness it. Amen.